Good morning, friends, or good afternoon. I broke my watch. I can't tell what time it is. Still morning. Friends. Still morning, is it? All right. Uh, besides, we are living in eternity. We have no time. <laughs> time limit stopped when Jesus Christ gave me his life inside of me to live by. So we are eternal creatures right now, sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a time. I've, this is just my second day here with you, but my, it's like cold molasses on a morning, you know. It's so thick, wonderful. I have never enjoyed myself anymore in any meeting. And I'm looking around now at night. You're so crowded, I can't see nobody, but today I can look around. I had the privilege of shaking hands with this fine bunch of ministers in this uh, group here. Remember an old man used to come to our church by the name of John Ryan, Elder Ryan, they call him, he's from Dwajack, Michigan. And he used to preach a little bit and then run back and shake my hand. And then he preached a little bit and run back and shake my hand. I said, Brother Ryan, I, I appreciate that, but I, I don't get the meaning of why you do it. He said, when the battery gets low, I need a charge. <laughs> so I just got all charged up. <laughs> I just seen a, a Methodist minister from up in my country that just received the Holy Ghost and I baptized him. Sitting over here to my left, Brother Junior Jackson, I seen him shaking his hands like that, kind of remind me of, of Brother Ryan. How many thinks that the Methodists can't receive the Holy Ghost? You're mistaken. Stand up, Brother Junior Jackson. <laughs> him and his lovely wife there, there from down in Indiana there, a Methodist minister. Where's Wilbur Collins? Is he in the building this morning? Where are you at, Brother Wilbur? I thought he was around here. Another Methodist minister standing over here. If you don't think Methodists can receive the Holy Ghost, be rebaptized. Stand up, Brother Collins. There's another one. <laughs> Brothers up at Asbury College, Wilmore, Kentucky. I have a fine Methodist background. Now, there's some more people with me here that's, uh, uh, that's come down. I heard him say amen, and I know they're here, but I can't see them. Brother, Brother Fred Southman from the Tabernacle at Jeffersonville. Fred, are you and Brother Tom here? I've been hearing him say, here, over here in the corner, yes. We are very happy to introduce these men. I don't exactly see at this time. There's perhaps more here that I don't know. I think Brother Jack Moore just got through speaking, and, and so um, these are fine men. And we love them. And now, it's uh, been such a wonderful time of being here. I said to her wife, my wife, I said, you, you should have come down to this meeting. We believe in a, a nice, old-fashioned Pentecostal meeting. We believe that we're the liberty and the Spirit of God. That all different phases of denominations can come together and set together in heavenly places as a church. Our differences makes no difference there. When we're in Christ, we're under the blood and in the fellowship of his love. And I want to say this to this group of ministers. I, I come into Pentecost from a missionary Baptist, and I have admired Pentecost here my people. I love them. If I thought there's any church any more right than that, I'd be at the other church. But I'm with Pentecost because I think it's the closest thing that I see to the Scripture. If I know something else, I'd be with them. And um, so not disregarding any other belief, not at all. But the reason I think of Pentecost because it's closer to what I think is scriptural than what anything that I know of. And there's one outstanding thing in this convention that I have noticed. That's clean-faced women. <laughs> None of that manicure, you know, or what you call it. Stuff. I don't like that. That ain't becoming a Christian. No, that's right. I, I like that. I'm the old-fashioned school. I like cleanness, you say. I like to see women. You know, I don't mean this is no place to say anything, jokes and the sacrilegious to say so, but I don't say this for that mean. This is no place for that. By the way, when did you all get this thing? This come from my tabernacle, it looks like. Sure does. Is that right, church? I look like the old pulpit. <laughs> well, um, I think the same old message we preached there goes across it anyhow. So, 
You know, there's only one woman in the Bible that ever painted her face. And she never painted her face to meet God. She painted her face to meet man. Right. You know what God did for her? Fed her to the dogs. Right. So when you see a woman wearing paint, you just say, Good morning, Miss Dog Meat. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's awful, isn't it? But that's what God thinks about it. She just made common dog meat for wild dogs. And that's about what she is. Some of these wild wolves that goes around... Whistling, you know what they call wolfing, you know. That's what it is, just dog meat again. I'm thankful for you women. God grant the grace to hold you in the sight of the cross. Get away from these things of the earth. After all, we're on a road to glory. We're citizens of another kingdom. Long time ago, I... Just looking around over the audience to see if I could see one of the people. And that's some of our colored friends, the Negro. You know, a long time ago down here in the South, they used to make slaves out of them. I'm a Southerner. And there's one thing I like to say about him. I wish I could talk to Martin Luther King. That man, being a Christian, don't know he's leading his people right into a death trap where there's going to be millions of them killed. Man, he's wrong. I love my brethren, my colored brethren. I wouldn't be an African around preaching to them if I didn't love them. They're God's people, the same as we are. But I don't believe that that man under this is only going to cause many, many, many more of them to be killed. Then it'll start a revolutionary again. That'll never wait out of the people down here. So they're not slaves. They have as much freedom as anybody else. They, if they were slaves, I'd be on that side. But they're not slaves. It's just because they want to go to school. They got schools. Let them go to school. That's right. Is there, remember that old colored brother standing up that morning in that riot? Yes, the, Militia, if he could speak, he said, I never was ashamed of being a black man. My maker made me a black man, but this morning I'm ashamed of the way my race has acted. What's them people doing to us? Only been good to us. A white woman raised up and said, I don't want my children schooled by a white woman. He said, because they, she won't pay the, the interest, take interest in my children like a colored woman was in my own race. He said, there, so look at our schools. We've got swimming pools. We've got better schools and everything. Why do we want to go to their schools? That's right. I believe God is a God of, of, well, I'd say he's a God of variety. He makes big mountains and little mountains. He makes deserts. He makes forests. He makes white man, black man, red man. We should never cross that up. It becomes a hybrid. And anything hybrid cannot rebreed itself. You're ruining the race of people. There's some things about a colored man that a white man don't even possess them traits. A um, white man's always stewing and worrying, a colored man's satisfied in the state he's in. So they don't need those things. But back in the slave time, they were selling slaves, human beings, like an auction block, like they would have used car lot. There's a buyer come forth through the country and he'd buy them up and go sell them and make money on them just like you would on a used car or something. Never was God's program. God made man, man made slaves. One's not to rule over the other, or to live together in unity and peace. And this man come to an old plantation, he, he wants to say, how many slaves you got? said, a hundred or more. He's looking them over, and he happened to notice there was one slave among those people. The slaves were sad. The Boers of Africa had caught the slaves, brought them over here and made and sold them. And they know they'd never go back to the homeland. They know they were here for the rest of their life. They never see their children again. They never see Papa and Mama. They were here for all the time and they were sad and they'd even carry whips and whip them to make them work. And so they had to make them work because they didn't want to work. It was just all broke down. This slave buyer looked over there and he found among these slaves there was one young fella. They didn't have to whip him, chest up, chin up, 
right on the job. And the broker said to the owner of the slave, said, I want to buy that slave. He said, he's not for sale. <laughs> he said, he seems to be different from the other slaves. He said, he is. He said, what makes the difference? Is he a boss over the rest of them? He said, no, no, just a slave. He said, maybe you feed him different than you do the rest of them. He said, no, he eats in a galley with the rest of the slaves. He said, what makes him so much different? He said, I always wondered that myself till I found out. Over in the homeland in Africa, where he come from, his father is a king of the tribe. And regardless of where he's at, he still knows he's the son of a king. And he acts like one. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. If you're a daughter of a king, then don't act like the world. If you're a son of a king, don't act like the world. We are, we know that we are sons and daughters of God. Though we're here in a dark world of death and sorrow, yet we know where our heritage is. We are sons and daughters of a king. Not a king, but the king. Let's act like it. A few moments ago, the reason I was late, a little Ethiopian girl making up the room. I noticed she was doing something. I was trying to write out some scripture text for something I wanted to speak on. Don't come to speak this to be heard. I come to say something that will help the church, to do some help. And then I'm studying, and this little lady kept kind of holding around directly. She said, would you pardon me, sir? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, they tell me that you is a man who did it, got favor before God, that when you pray for the sick, that God answers your prayer. I said, he don't only answer mine, but he answers anybody that'll believe him. She said, I'm sick, sir. Would it be out of the way that if I asked you to have a little prayer for me? I said, not at all. I stepped up to her. I prayed something like this. Lord Jesus, many years ago when you were dragging an old rugged cross up a sandy hill, dragging out the footprints, the blood that was straying down off your back. Your little frail body got so weak that a, you fell beneath the load. There was one standing by by the name of Simon, a Negro. He picked up the cross and helped you bear it. Here's one of his children this morning, sick. About that time it happened. <laughs> He's God of the whole human race. Now, friends, you're such a nice audience. And me being coming off the field of missions out down there before devils and witch doctors and so forth, don't you think they won't challenge you? You better know what you're talking about when you come before them. But under such as that, and then come in here where the home fires are burning amongst Christians and so forth, you don't know what a release it is for a man to stand like this. I wish that I could just sit back there in the audience and hear these fine uh, anointed brethren preach the word and I could just raise up my hands and cry and shout and pray and uh, what a what a what a thing it is to warm by the fire it, it's such a wonderful thing but usually my brethren I've got so many brethren that love me and they ask me to speak and therefore I know that call to the service of the king I must try to work the best I can but I always overdo it by staying too long. I know you're waiting for your dinner. I've been in here since 8 o'clock this morning or something in this uh, group of people. But I thought that coming this afternoon to speak to you for just a short time, I uh, wrote out some notes here and some scriptures that I'd like to refer to. And in doing this, thinking that you got man here who's far more eligible and a calling of God to take this place than me, but mine is prayer for the sick, seeing visions and so forth. And I was talking to someone a few minutes ago, if you look in Life magazine last month, you see there, you got that tape. I'm not a tape salesman, uh, but if you ever believe the words that I preach, and you can afford it, get the seven seals and first get a time as it serves. Listen to that spoke of six months before it happened. And science is baffled. Standing right under where it was happening there and told him six months before, 
how that there'd be seven angels in a form of a constellation and look like a pyramid would drop down. I'd be standing north of Tucson, Arizona, and there would be a roar that would even shake the rocks from the mountains. Brother Fred Softman sitting there who was standing with us. Many of them when it happened. Now science took the picture of it. You've seen it. One on Associated Press. They didn't know what it was. There's a cloud hanging 26 miles high. That's 15 miles or 20 above even more vapors at. They don't know what's all going about. And they're trying to investigate it. There right under, I was standing, and there was seven angels roaring out their voices of those seven seals, standing there and a witness, three of us as a witness of the things that was prophesied on the tape. Sirs, what time is it? And there now they're trying to find out it's a mystery to them. Some of them said, go, go, won't you go tell them? It'd be just like when the angel of the Lord appeared here at Houston, Texas, in that light. I told the people all my life I've seen that light. The church knows it. Science knows it. It's, everything has to testify when Jesus Christ makes a move. There it is. The magazine, if you want to look at it, it's the one that's got Rockefeller and his new wife on the back. I think it's May's issue of the Life magazine. He's God. We're living in the last days. Now, I've come this morning to try to pick out a few notes here and things to speak on something that would help the church, would help with these minister brothers to put my shoulders to the wheel with these men. We are brothers, and they bring me here because they believe in the same ministry. You've been saved during this meeting. Why don't you take your membership up with some of these fine churches here that believes this type of ministry? They, they believe it. They stand behind it. And I, I come that we might lay down the Scripture and for something that might help the church. And my subject, like this morning, is to what state that I think the Pentecostal church is of this day. What stand, what hour are we standing in and what's the possibility? Now, let me quote that again. What state the church is standing in now, and what possibilities lies ahead for it? I want to read from the Scripture for a text, and I want to read from the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, 27th and 28th verses. And the house was filled with men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women, and beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. I pray thee, strengthen me. I pray thee, only this once, O oh Lord, that I may be once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. I would like to take the text out of that form that, O oh Lord, just once more. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. It must have been a a lovely afternoon, something like we're enjoying today here on this campground, here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And there was a great celebration going on, but very much contrary than what the celebration is today. There was about 3,000 Philistines looking down from the galleys to a strange pair that entered the great arena. And highly honored warlords and their fancy jewel-decked ladies was all setting in position. And as it was then, there was a, oh, something like a mushroom, that there was the building setting upon pillars that went out something like maybe a modernistic type of architecture. 
And all these Philistines gathered up there and had placed themselves up for this great event. And they were in this great celebration and all eyes were centered to the middle of the arena. They must have stood up to get a, a better look at the event was just about to take place. And now as we sit here this afternoon, let's see if we can, um, with imaginary mind, place ourselves in that position to look at this scene. What do we see coming, moving out to the center of the arena, come a little boy holding the hand of a blind man stumbling, staggering along, that had many monkey shows and, and little tricks and so forth. But now has arrived the time for the main event, the thing that they had waited on so long, the main event of the day. The preliminaries were over. The halls that echoed all afternoon with drunken reverie. For they were celebrating the victory of Dagon, their fish god, over the ark and the promise of Jehovah. What a disgraceful sight it is as we can imagine such a thing taking place of the fish god of a heathen nation celebrating the victory over the servants of Jehovah. All because of the failure of of the man to carry out the things that he'd been ordained to do. And here was the heathen, drunken, brawling out, jewel women, painted faces, a modern Hollywood celebration, bringing the servant of the Lord God <coughs> Helm in shackles for the main event of the afternoon. The lad must have drug along as stumbling come this great mass of human flesh. Both eyes out, hair hanging down his back, tied and bound to make entertainment for a drunken, brawling bunch of unbelievers. He must have stumbled to the post to where they were going to make the fun start from. Now I think of that, I think about a church that was ordained of God to do something for God. I have suffered the enemy to blind its eyes from the Word of the living God and the commandments of God and to the task that it was ordained of God to do. Only to be sport in a hiding place for God Drunken, painted face, jewel decked, short wearing, bobbed haired women, man of the world. A church that ought to be shining in the power and the strength of the law. What a disgrace. How humiliating it must have been for Samson with all of his framework made up that was more than able and had 
prove God had his strength through his framework. And every muscle that he ever had still was in his body. But the blessings of the Lord had left him. We may have all of our framework. We may have our denominational rituals. We may have our names in the papers and on the ledgers. But I wonder today if the Pentecostal church isn't standing about the same place. With its eyes poked out from the Word of God and for the purpose that Jesus died that we together could fellowship around the Word and the things of God. Humiliated he was in the midst of the time that he lived. As I see Samson stand there, it's a symbol. A symbol of a fallen, morally corrupted nation and a morally fallen, corrupted church. Because he both symbolized Israel as a nation and the power of God which belongs in the church. It was certainly a pathetic sight as we see him stand there. After all, is bringing out there in this lad leading him in no eyes. If the enemy can only blind your eyes from the real thing of God, you'll walk right over the top of it and not know it. Amen. No matter what God does and vindicates it by His Scripture and proves it by His power, if your eyes are not open to the things of God, you'll walk right over it as blind as you can be. And there He stands. So it must have been a breathtaking time as these drunken soldiers and women with their cocktail glasses in their hand, I can hear it echo across the halls. So this is Samson, the mighty man of God, the mighty man of Valor, the great warrior, standing in that condition. I'd imagine to those warriors as they stood with their arms around their modern Hollywood sweethearts and their fine tinsel jewelry dangling the members of this great church of Dagon, I imagine some of them could re remember that by the name of Samson, his very name shook them. Amen. His very name brought, brought fear upon him. Amen. For he was anointed of God. Many of them remembered it. Many of them soldiers standing there could remember of seeing him standing with the jawbone of a mule in his hand and a thousand dead Philistines laying there. Yes. How could it happen? When the jawbone of a mule hit one of those helmets practically an inch and a half thick of solid brass, while you strike that helmet with the jawbone of a mule, that mule's jaw would fly to thousands of pieces. But Samson, with the power of God upon him, beat down a thousand Philistines, breaking down their shields of Laying them at the, his feet. Yes. I'd imagine many of those warriors that fled during that time stood back up there and remembered. And that is sense. They remembered a scene, the jawbone in his hands and saying, Who else wants some of this? He was a man who could speak. He's a man who was anointed of God. God promised to bless him. He was in the strength of Jehovah. Oh, no doubt there's many here can remember back when the church stood in that kind of strength. 
But now, all broke up. All kinds of denominations, one fighting the other. The old all-night prayer meetings is not heard of no more. Street meetings is absolutely gone. They're obsolete. Yet we got our structure. We got the framework. But where is the God of miracles? Frankly, many deny. Even denying divine healing, many. Right here in this state, I had a, a church man with a great church said, I want to get some seats to put here in hot springs at the armory when I was here, me and Brother Moore. And a Pentecostal man said, I wouldn't even let, he wouldn't let me have the seats. He said, I wouldn't let anybody sit on my seats that believed in divine healing. That's not only here, it's everywhere. What's the matter? Prejudice. Because of sponsorships and other organizations. Forgetting that we are God's people by birth. Amen. Samson had forgot that also. I remember, I guess while he was standing there, there was some of them remember that night at Gaza. How that the man could pick up the gates of Gaza. Lay him up on his shoulders when they tried to fancy him in. You can't fence the anointing of God in. No organization can hold it. God saves all who he's called. All the fathers giving me will come. They thought they had him fenced in. And he picked up the gates and put them up on his shoulders and walked away. Put up the top of the hill and sat down. Big brass gates that would weigh up the tons. And a, a little man pull them out of the rocks, fold them up and lay them on his shoulder and walk up the hill with them. From anything that stood in the way of God. Many of them in that drunken brawl could remember that of Samson. But what was the matter today? He didn't. There stood Samson. But the Spirit of the Lord didn't come on him no more. He wasn't anointed. He had been stripped of this power by a woman that lured him away from the commandments of the Lord. I wonder today if that isn't something like our churches. See? Woman in the Bible represents church. And wonder if we haven't listened to the lure of other denominations. Tried to educate our ministers into a, a Bachelor of Arts degree. That our congregation could say, our pastor has a B.A., D.D., or L.D. Wonder if we haven't went off on some great wild tantrums. They'll try to build a church that's a little better than the Methodists or the Presbyterian. We'd be better off in some mission with the Spirit of God upon us than we would be in this condition. Wonder if we haven't proselyted and pulled from one to the other to try to make our organizations grow. And we've got great structure, but where is the Spirit of the Lord? There he stood stripped by a woman. What must have went through that man's mind as he stood there? He had time to think it over. I hope the church gets that much time. Which is more to you? A million more or a deeper blessing of God in your soul? We have searched and could have many more things that I have jotted here about those lords and what Samson did, what they were thinking. Now, let's go down to Samson. And what do you think was going through his mind? Of the many victories that he had had. The many great things that he had done when the Spirit of the Lord was on him. But he was conscious that he had every muscle. 
but the Spirit of the Lord was missing. Let me tell you something, church. Don't try to join the most fancy church, the most eloquent bunch. You stay with Christ. Amen. Well, the Spirit of the Lord is. Yeah. Then he must have thought of the great victories that God had given him, and of the times that when his eyes were opened that he could see the promises of God. But now, since he's been caught up into this thing, his eyes has been put out. So many people today get caught away in mental illusions. Never think to search the Scripture to see whether it's right or not. Others try to say it doesn't make any difference. Paul in Acts 19 thought it made a difference. And he said, if an angel from heaven preached any other thing, let him be cursed. It does make a difference. Now we see Samson standing there. How he's thinking of the things that he once did with the kingdom of God. And of how God, he had failed God. And he had failed God's people. Yes, sir. Now he's a prisoner of the very nation that God raised him up to destroy. I want to coast here a minute. Pentecost. You know I love you. When I come to you, Jack Moore, Richard T. Reed, Brother G. H. Brown, Brother Ben Pemberman, and other great men, to find out the things that you had. It seemed that we had so much in common that we like a glove that fit on a hand. I fit right with you. For the message, not knowing there was such a church, that I believed in, here was a group of people all ready to receive it. I'm still Brother Brandon. I'm still your brother. And I love you. But do you realize the very thing that God raised you up for, you have surrendered to it. God brought you out of them organizations years ago to make a people out of you, and you turned around and organized the thing just of what God brought you out to defy. I challenge any person to show me any place in history since the church first organized, which was a Roman Catholic church, at the Le- Lady of Sia, uh, Nicaea, rather, Rome, uh, when the Catholic church was organized and made an organization, and has any church from Martin Luther this side, when God gave Martin Luther the revelation of justification, and as soon as Luther was gone, they made an organization out of it, and it fell. Along come Wesley, after him and Asbury and so forth left, they made an organization out of it, and it fell. Along come Alexander Campbell, and it fell with the organization. Along come John Smith for the Baptist, and it fell. And every time that man has tried to organize something of a man-made system, it fell and never did rise again. There's not no history nowhere where any church that ever organized but what did fall and everyone fell never rose again. The children of Israel in type was to follow the pillar of fire. Amen. And every night, they must be ready not to organize and sit down here, but to move with the fire. Amen. That's what God wants His people to do. Amen. Move with the Spirit. Amen. Move with the time. Amen. You say, well, Brother Brown, we've had all kinds of rains and inner rains and outer rain. You're intelligent. I don't care what kind of a revelation it is and how good it looks. If it's not according to God's Word, 
Leave it alone. Amen. This is the blueprint through the wilderness. The word of the law. But here stands the church today, the Pentecostal church, in about 20 or 30 different organizations. Each one calling the other and this, that, and the other, buzzard roost and so forth. What a disgrace when the very thing that God pulled you out of them denominations for, you turned around and done the very same thing that they did. That's exactly what Samson done. God raised up Samson to destroy the nation. And God raised you up for a people, not an organization. But when God started Israel from the from Egypt, they were only about ten days' journey from the promised land, about forty miles. But they stayed in the wilderness for forty years. Why? Grace had furnished them a lamb for their sins, a circumcision of a sign, a pillar of fire as a witness, Moses as a prophet. Grace had provided everything they had need of, but they wanted something to do themselves. Little did they know when Miriam was dancing with the tambourine and the children of Israel dancing with her, and Moses singing in the Spirit. They were only ten days from the full promised land. Little did they know forty years and their carcass would rot in the wilderness. What did it? Israel made its most rational uh, decision it ever made when it accepted law instead of grace, when they wanted to make some bishops and something of their own, something they had to do into it. God was in the midst of them, leading them. Amen. And that's exactly what Pentecost did. When God revealed some new, something in the Scripture, instead of, they call it new issues or whatever you want to do about it. But when God revealed something, instead of accepting truth and testing it with the Bible, they pulled out and made an organization and separated themselves. And then along come this, that, and the other, and now you stand Corrupted. The Pentecostal church bound in the fetters of organization. The thing that God raised you up to destroy. And now you're just as organized as they are. Godly men in every one of them. Women. It's true. Every one of them. And we're everyone guilty. Pop cannot call Kittle Black. We are all guilty. Every one of us. You oneness, twoness, threeness, and, and whatever you might be. What a disgrace. What a reproach that you brought upon Jesus Christ. What a reproach to the name of Pentecost. They've brought so much reproach to become a disgraceful name almost. The people hardly want to associate themselves with such a name. It's because that you did what you were supposed not to do. And going on and following the commandments of the Lord should be one great unit of God marching on to victory today. Let a woman lure him away from the Word of God. Now he stands doing tricks for the devil. That's right. It's just exactly same thing is taking place today. Let Jezebel, the mother of harlots, Revelation 17, says that she was a mother of harlots. Now, if she's a whore, that's a, that's a woman that lives untrue to her husband. She claims Christ her husband and don't live by his commandments. Amen. And what are the other churches doing? What is a harlot? is the same thing as the other. What is it? Prostitution to God's Word. And she was a mother of harlots. And let that Jezebel doctrine and so forth because a bunch of intellectual men that wants to get together and organize something so they can have big names themselves. 
There stands the church divided brotherhood. Oh, what a disgrace. Then I like it. What a terrible thing it is. Spiritually blind. Oh, you say, well, I'm not spiritually blind. Action speaks louder than words. Yeah. Prove you're blind by the way you stumble over things. Okay? I remember this tape's being made when we sent around the world. Said, I'm not as much speaking right here, but this goes to about 17 different nations out in the jungles and everywhere. Spiritually blind. Blind to what? The Word of God. Yeah. The truth of God. Your organization won't let fine ministers that come to me and say, I believe that to be the truth, Brother Bram, but if I preach that, oh, there you are. If I believe that, well, the people, would, I don't care what the people says, I don't care what the organization says. It's what God says to be the truth. And if it's the truth of God, God will back it up. How can you expect to have faith when you have desires to honor one from another. Amen. It takes faith away from you. Went back to the denominations. Pentecost that was born out of denomination. Pentecost was not born in a denomination. He was born out of a denomination. And the cunningness of Satan pulled you right back into it. Where you come out of. As a hog went to its Walla, and the dog goes to its walla. Now look at them, defeated. We are to already be over in the promised land. Jesus Christ ought to be so imminent among us, till there wouldn't be any sickness. Oh, him would be glorious. There shouldn't be bobbed-haired women, short-wearing dresses, and. And it shouldn't be man that's married three or four times deacons in our church. And don't tell me it's not in Pentecost. It sure is. But it's because of social prestige. It oughtn't to be, but it is. Why? Because denominational pull, political, money, instead of coping with the word, fresh out some precious brother and put somebody on because he's got a big social standing in the town. I want a man that's got social standing and glory. In the world. If you don't know his ABCs, what difference does it make? You know what ABC stands for? Always believe Christ. Uh, you learn that. Some man come to me not long ago and said, Brother Branham is very one of the best known Pentecostal ministers in the land. He took me up in his room. He said, I want to pray for you. I said, I'm not sick. He said, I, I, I love you. I said, that's mutually felt. He said, told me, he said, why don't you leave off of telling them women about their bobbed hair and all this kind of stuff and about the church? He said, that's not your business. I said, whose is it then? He said, it'll come to pass that you won't have nothing but a bunch of posts to preach to you. I said, I'd rather do that and preach the truth and compromise with the devil. He said, I said, I said, I said, Brother Branham, didn't God call you to pray for the sick? And I said, yes, sir. He said, the people believe you to be a prophet. And I said, well, that, that, I never said that. He said, but they believe you that way. And said, if you're a prophet, why don't you stand your time to teaching people how spiritual gifts and how to... Uh, heal the sick and, and how to do these, get these spiritual gifts and help the church instead of standing constantly bawling the women out, bawling the man out and things like that. Say, so, well, why don't you leave them alone? Say, so, won't you teach them something greater than bobbed hair and stuff? Let that alone. I said, how can I teach them algebra when they don't even know their ABCs? <laughs> Let them learn their ABCs first. An old minister went and preached justification at a revival. Second night, third night, fourth night, fifth night, the deacons called him out and said, Reverend, don't you know no more than the sermon on justification? Said, oh, sure, but let them all get justified first, then we preach something else. That's right. Oh, if you can only get back to the foundation. There stood Samson defeated. 
Now look, we might be prettier, that might be so. But it's just like us coming down the road the other day, I seen a big sign that said, Funks, a hybrid corn, how great it was. But it ain't no good. It's just as no good as it can be. It is killing the nation. You read uh, Reader's Digest of women keep on eating hybrid beef and corn things they can't have a baby in 20 years from now. There's no good in it. What is a hybrid hotbed plant? If it is an original plant, you have to keep spraying it all the time to keep the bugs off of it. The bugs will eat it up. But if it's an original plant, you don't have to spray it. A good, healthy plant, a bug won't crawl on it. That's what's the matter. You have to keep bathing people in the church. Glory to God, sisters. You're a hybrid. You're brought into some other way. You take that hybrid corn and plant it back in what you got. Nothing. It won't even make nothing. The church is pretty today, that's true. Bigger buildings than you ever had. The greatest congregations you ever preached to. The better intellected ministers than you used to have. You used to have men out of the cornfield somewhere that God called out there on the broom sage patch. But now you sent your children to school and made grandchildren out of them and come back with all the PhDs and LLD and even one of the great Pentecostalist churches today, before they send a man to the mission fields, he has to stand before a psychiatrist to see if he's mentally intellected enough. Think of it in Pentecost. The requirement was not a mental test. It was a test of the Holy Spirit. To fill that in. That's out of the question to the people today. Did you know the Roman Catholic Church was first the original Pentecostal church? It'd take you 2,000 years to get the condition it's got today. If this Pentecostal organization keeps on another 50 years, it'll be worse than the Catholic Church. Right? Sin heaping on every side. I might not think that I, you might think I'm crazy, but I know where I'm at. It's true. You just wait, you'll find out. Yes, the hybrid, hybrid corn causing women to narrow in their hips and widen in the shoulders and so forth. Evolution used to tell us that in evolution that uh, certain animals got together and bred something different and something different to come on out to a man. They kept searching around to disprove their own theory. Let me tell you something. You farmer here. What makes a mule? He is the office animal in the world. He's a hybrid. He ain't got no sense to begin with. Can't teach him nothing. You wait all his life to get kicky just before he dies. You can't tell him nothing. What is it? Because he's a hybrid. Just remind me of some hybrid Christians, so called. You can try to tell an old mule something, stand with his ears up and go, huh, huh, huh. All he knows is bray and cow. You can't tell him truth and teach him nothing. That's the way these people tell them about Christ. The same yesterday, dead forever. Oh, oh, the days of miracles is past. A braying of some seminary that we learn. It's a hybrid. The Holy Spirit will punctuate every commandment of God with an amen. That's a seminary something, spirit breathing out of him. Not praying against the Word of God. If it's the Holy Spirit, it'll punctuate it. Amen. Amen. You know, I think a mule is ignorance. But you know what? He can't tell who his papa was or his mama was. Right. See, his father was a little jack. His mother was a mare. But he can't breed back. He's finished. A plant can't breed itself back. Take a white violet and a blue violet, bring out your pink violet, plant it two or three times, it'll come back either white or pink. See, that proves. See, they never come like that. God said, let everything bring forth of its own seed. And that's the way it remains. Man was made in the image of God, not a monkey. That crazy stuff. Notice, you know, the ignorance of the mule. But you know what? I, I, you can't tell him nothing. He's hard-headed. But I think a real thoroughbred horse. Oh, my. He knows who his mama was. 
who his papa's wife, his pedigreed. He knows all of his grandparents and everything because he's got a pedigree. That's the way it is for these hybrid so-called Christians. Days of miracles fast. Well, we Presbyterians, we Methodists, we so-and-so don't believe this. We Trinitarians, we so-and-so, we don't, we don't do this. See, you don't know where you do stand. But a genuine, born-again, pedigree Christian from the book of Acts knows exactly where he stands. He's born of the Spirit and hears his pedigree. Come from the branch of God. It'll produce the same thing each time. No wonder the church is more prettier. But what's the matter? It's run out of spirit. It's bred itself out with the world. Let the women wear shorts. Play the piano. Let them wear makeup. Let the man get married four or five times and hold their place. Position. All these forms of things that they go through, just exactly what the Scripture said. She's just as much defeated as Samson was. Just exactly. Yes, sir. Oh, as Samson thought, I, may, I don't want to hold you too long. I'll skip some of these texts here. As Samson must have stood there and thought of his era and where he could be. Remember Israel. Can I, will you pardon me a minute to go back to Israel? Do you know what? What did they do those 40 years when they made their organization out there? Instead of going on through led by the pillar of fire, the angel of the Lord, which was Christ, instead of going on through and following him, in about ten days they had been in the full promise. Amen. But you know what? They wandered in the wilderness, the Bible said. They come to Kadesh Barnea, which was the judgment seat. And there, when the spies come back and talked about the land, they said, we can't do it. Caleb and Joshua said, we're more than able to do it. For they was looking to God's promise, not what the circumstances was. We can't have a church without having uh, an organization. Well, you don't see what God said. That's right. What did they do? Did God bless them? Sure. Sure. They wandered about. They married wives. They planted vineyards. And they had babies. And they increased. And they done good in the wilderness. That's right. But they still wasn't in full blessing. So when all these who made this great big group of organization, old fighters it was called, right? God let them stay there till every one of them died. And then he started with the new generation. Under the leadership of Joshua who believed the word. Amen. And he took them to the promised land. Oh God. May this young generation of Pentecostals get the, get the vision. Okay. They went on to the promised land. We are to be where we have all kinds of the gifts of God. We did speak with tongues. That's right. That's fine. Nothing against that. Moses crossed the Red Sea. The enemy was killed behind him. We, we, we appreciate that. But that's still not all of it. How little did your fathers and mothers think when he's standing out there and shooting pistols through the windows at him and them dancing in the spirit that their children would ever come to this? Amen. 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 But it did. But there's a new generation coming on now. Samson's hair has grown out. Watch. Don't never let Delilah ever weave you back into something like that. Mm-hmm. Stay away from it. That's the thing that's cursed you. You was raised up to condemn it. I've tried my best to do it, though I've stood alone. And I've tried my best to stand to the commandments of God. I see the church stand there stripped of the power of God, stripped of the blessings, stripped of the gifts, and God will pour His gift down. They sit they say, that's mind reading, mental telepathy. One they ought to be embracing him. Yeah. Well, he's over at the oneness now. Don't, that's uh, that may be for the oh, they were at this side of the other. Yeah. Oh, if you'd only know your day, don't let it pass you. This is the hour uniting in Christ. Notice Samson standing there thinking of his era, the things that he had done. 
Finally he realized what caused him to be that way. The enemy put his eyes out. And that's the first thing that an organization will do. It'll put your eyes out to any other fellowship but them of your own. Amen. 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 I could say a whole lot of things right there, but I, I won't do it. But you, if you're spiritual minded, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. It'll put your eyes out, just you and your group. Amen. If you're a Methodist, you're only Methodist. If you're Baptist, you're only Baptist. If you're Presbyterian, you're, if you're oneness, if you're twoness, if you're threeness, or how many more they got. See, you're just that. The rest of them's no good. The Baptists had a slogan in the days of Billy Graham's early days, 40, uh, 44 million more. What did you get? A bunch of cigarette-smoking, church-joining hypocrites. Amen. When Billy himself, when I was at his breakfast... He said, you know what's the matter? He said, here's the example. He said, I'll go in. He said, St. Paul went into a city. He'd have one convert. And he went back a year from then and said, that one convert produced 30 more. He said, I'll go into a city for six weeks and have 30,000 decisions. And I can come back in six months and can't find 30. Well, I, I admired the man for his courage, but I'd like to ask him one question. Who took Paul's convert? <laughs> what lazy pastor about him? What was it? Paul stayed with him Amen. until he was thoroughly a child of God born of the Spirit. Amen. He took him so far in Christ till he couldn't even look back. He just walk up and maybe join the church or even speak with tongues. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. But I know that all that speak with tongues don't have the Holy Ghost. I've seen witch doctors speak in tongues and drink blood out of a human skull and call on the devil. Speak in tongues and interpret it. That ain't no soundproof. No, no. The life of Christ in you. The fruit bearing itself record. That's it. But we settle down on that. If a man spoke with tongues, that's all. They come in. Look what you got today. That's true speaking in tongues, but not all the truth. Like the colored man eating a slice of watermelon. He said, how'd you like it, Moses? He said, that was good, boss, but there's surely some more of it. If I can speak with tongues, surely there's some more of it. (laughs) But what do we do? Just like Israel settled on that one thing and wandered in the wilderness now for 40 years. Still without the rest of it over in the promised land. It's exactly what we've done. Samson's standing there. I must hurry. Must have looked back. Thought of all those things, and here he was, the very reason he was raised up, he was blind. And is, there is great structure, his great organization of a human body, a mountain of flesh stand. There's great, big, huge muscles, but no strength. Amen. Here we stand today, back then when Pentecost used to rank just so many, maybe four or five hundred people across the whole nation. Today, it's the fastest growing church in the world. Right. What are we getting in? A bunch of members. With our great framework, we ought to be 10,000 times stouter than we was when we started, and we're 10,000 times weaker than we was when we started. Because we're building it upon a, a bottomless foundation, upon organization, something that God has cursed. And how can we build a, a church upon the chars of a Sodom and Gomorrah? I hope you don't hate me. Well, you just sit still a minute and listen. Amen. You can't do it. What God's cursed, He's cursed. They can keep me away from anything that God cursed. I want what is blessing. Amen. Right. Notice, as He stood there thinking, the warlords, half drunk, stand there, I remember that great person. I remember when he stood with a jawbone of a, of a mule in his hand. I remember when he folded up the gates of Gaza and walked to the top of the hill. I remember all these things. When that lion roared at him, that little bitty fellow, the spirit come up on him and he just tore that lion in two with his hand. And here he stands, yes. bound. By little kids leading him around. And our God, the fish God Dagon, has won the victory over him. 
There you are. The world has creeped into the church and won the victory. It's undressed our women. It's put a desire in the people's heart to stay home and watch television instead of going to the church. And the, the love of the world has creeped in and took our Pentecostal church for a hell-bound ride. The desire and the faith run a person through a prayer line and let them see whatever takes place. The next night, here they are right back again. Abraham see. The faith isn't there. It should be there, but it isn't. When you, God told Abraham once in 25 years, he looked for it. No matter how far back it got, I can hear him say to Sarah, go out there, you're 65 years old. Go buy some bird eye and get some pins and make some booties. We're going to have the baby. How do you know you're going to have it? God said so. That's settled it. The first see she's about 20 years past menopause. He lived with her since she was about 16 years old as a young man. Didn't make any difference. He didn't look at that. He didn't consider that. He considered what God said. Yeah. Separated himself from all unbelief. Went out into the wilderness. That's what's the trouble today. You want to make yourself with an organization of unbelief instead of separating yourself from the things of the world. You want to see how close you can ride to the end of sin. See how far back you can stay away from it. All right. But here they was. The first 30 days or 28 days passed. Mixed audience now. And you adults know what I'm speaking of. Sarah, honey, how you feel? No difference at all, Abraham. Glory to God, we're going to heaven anyhow. Amen. How do you know God said so? Yes. Ten years passed. Amen. Keep them pins laying there and all the bird on. Some of his friends come by. Abraham, father of nations, how many children do you have? Glory to God. At this time, none but I'm going to have them. How do you, why, you're 90 years old. Don't make a bit of difference. It'll be a greater miracle now than it was if it happened back under 20 years ago. But today, I was prayed for last night. I don't feel any better today. Abraham seed. <laughs> What's the matter? You've been stripped. Your fibers of church is still there. Your organization is as great as the Methodist or the Baptist. You're building to this fiber all the time, but where is that genuine faith? Oh, you clap your hands. You shout and sing songs and dance. My, I've seen that happen in many doctors, witch doctors' meetings. See them clap their hands and speak in tongues and interpret and jump up and down. Father Divine has the same thing. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine faith that can unfold the promise of God to stand there and make it live. A scriptural thing. The Mohammed. I've seen them fall in the street and holler, Allah, 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 until they become so conscious. I mean, Billy Paul stood there and seen a man take a sword and punch it just under his heart and a doctor pour water through this side and come out the other side. See him take a, a piece of a lance and run it through his lips and up through his nose and don't even bleed a drop. Run spinners under his fingernails, hollering, Allah, 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 like that. A Mohammed despises the thoughts of Jesus Christ. He didn't have no Holy Spirit. No, but he had emotion. That's right. We're, Christianity is not exactly an emotion. Heathenism can produce just as much psychology as, as, as Christianity can. But that's not truth. We want truth. Christ is truth. What do we do? We fix yourself so we stand like Samson. Now, as he stood there thinking of what he could have been, I think today, and the church ought to stand and think with me a few minutes, what we could have been if these things hadn't have done this. What we could have been. Then it comes to his mind. Something arrives. I believe God did it. Oh, if it could only happen on this campground. There's a possibility. There is a possibility. God is forgiving there is a possibility. We ain't got long to stay here. Our time's running out. The Confederation of Churches has taken the country. It'll unite with Catholicism. We got the man in there just exactly. I wish I had time to go into it to show you that this nation is just exactly like Israel. It come into a, a strange land, drove out the occupants, and inherited the land. That's what we did. Israel. They had the first man, great man. Such man like Joshua, 
such man like David, like Solomon. But finally there come a man on the, on the kingship of Ahab, a renegade. We had great men at Washington and Lincoln, but now what have you done? The very thing that we come here for freedom for, you put it in the White House because you think more of your politics than you do about Christ. That's it, right. Remember, in that time, all the ministers give in. Jesse Bell was a leader. Listen, Ahab himself was a pretty nice guy, but Jezebel Bell was a neck behind the head. She was the one who did it. She was a renegade. I ain't got nothing against that man as a president, but it's that Jezebel system that's behind it. Can't you see these popes and things coming in now? One's raising a don't know Joseph. And the first thing you know, we're right now asking the Protestant church to consolidate with it and every organization will go right into the Federation of Churches. And now you're trapped. We are living off of tax money that will be paid in 40 years from the day. The nation's broke. Where's it at? Who's got the money? We haven't got it. Our, our bonds are no good. We've got to have gold. Who's got it? The Catholic Church. What will they do before these whiskey men and all these great holders and stockholders will ever give it up? They'll absolutely sell out and the church will loan the nation the money. And what it will do, it'll sell its birthright right straight into Catholicism. Amen. That's the gold of the world. Them and the Jews, and that's the covenant that he makes with Israel. See, you Bible readers can teach that in your church. You see, just showing you how to believe the same thing. That's how it'll have to come to pass, and we got it right there now. And here we are, organization with the mark of the beast upon us, just exactly like the first beast, an image unto it. A federation of churches joining a power, and they made an image unto the beast that he could both speak, and it done the same thing the first beast did before it. Right in our clutches. Oh, children, what time is it? Is there a possibility? Samson stood there and said, Just, is there a possibility? Samson happened to think, That great God, He's omnipresent, He's everlasting God. I see my mistake. I'm going to repent. Hallelujah. And he cried out. There is a possibility that we could do the same thing. They of that day, this day, don't see the vision like Samson. If we could only see the vision of a possibility, start right here, right now. A possibility. See? They sit tight and clap their hands and wonder what's going to come out to be. You're going to find out someday you're going to come out the little in the horn. See? That time. Have great gatherings and glittering, worldly things. All we think, well, you know what? We got more members than we ever had. And we can build a billions of dollars of buildings. Got more money than we ever had. Better churches, maybe than some of the Protestants or some of the others has got. Oh, man. Scholarship. Well, we take our children to school and build new seminaries for them to go into. Let me tell you right now, a man with an education without the Holy Spirit takes himself. Every degree gets farther away from God. Amen. Right. You say, I got a Bachelor of Art. Then you're just a little bit farther away than you was. Split an egg and Adam and stumble over a blade of grass that they don't know nothing about. You've heard the old saying, fools will walk with hobnail shoes where angels fear to try. Amen. Right. Scholarship. But it don't bring the Spirit. Don't bring the works and life of Jesus Christ. The trouble it is the church today is not like Samson. They're not willing to pay the price. Samson prayed right when he prayed. Lord, let me die with the enemy. He knew it was going to cost him something. He knew it was going to cost something. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost me something. Your social prestige, your place and position in the denomination. Lord, let me die. I see your purpose. He knew it was going to cost him something. You must be ready to die out to your enemy to get in the blessings of God. Samson is willing to pay the price to get the power of God again upon him. He's willing to do it. Are you? 
Are you willing to sacrifice your television programs? And You know, it used to be as wrong for us to go to movies. But now the devil put one over me and brought it right in the house with you. Right. Amen. I used to go around to an old Methodist preacher. He used to sing a song. We let down the bars. We let down the bars. We compromise with sin. We let down the bars. The sheep got out. But how did the goats get in? You let down the bars. That's all. Oh, I hear someone say, now, wait a minute, Brother Branham, we have revivals. Yeah, what is it? A denomination revival. That's right. Look at your morals and your differences. Is it a revival? Is there a breaking up time? Is there time that everybody can associate together and have fellowship? If your organization's in, it's all right. Mm. Getting farther away from the Word all the time. That's right. Making new bishops and everything, see? <laughs> Samson knew that his present backslidden condition could not produce the strength of the challenge of the hour. Man, women, my brothers and sisters, let me say this. The church in its present denominational condition cannot produce the strength to challenge the time. The call of the time. Man and women wants God. Honest hearts. You might... Leave the, the oneness and go to the two-ness. You might leave the two-ness and go to the three-ness. And you might do all this, that, or the other. You're only pulling a paper or, or mission trotting or uh, acting like a, uh, I don't know what, a juvenile kid. Right. That's right. You don't get it like that. Our backslidden strength is, cannot meet the challenge of this hour. The denominations will not take the vindication of the word. When Jesus Christ, as I tried to tell you last night, promised this in the last days. He promised to have it here. And you know that by the Bible. And for 15 years, back and forth across the nation, and they're getting worse all the time. That's right. They don't want it. They say, well, now, he associates with oneness, or he associates with Trinity. He does this, that, or the other. We associate with Christ. Out in every organization, trying, but God sees to that, that they see it. And the real believers are like the little prostitute last night. As soon as it flashed across her path in that seat of life, then there she believed it. It was all. It struck fire right now when these thousands standing there making fun of it, but not her. She knew that that was Messiah. She knew that that was a promise that when he come, he would do that. I wonder if we only knew the same thing, or if we got so wrapped up in our organization that we're forbidden to even look at it. I wonder if you look at the, the magazines and pictures and old dirty filth of the world instead of reading your Bible like you should be. Man shall not live by bread alone, by, by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Our children, our boys, has become a bunch of little Rickies and Rickettas. You know that's right. A bunch of hot rod drags and everything like that. And where do you find the Pentecostal boy with his hot rod on the street? Where do you find sister down at the canteen somewhere doing a rock and roll? Where do you find pop and mom, uh, pop out playing golf or out somewhere like that and mom out at some stitch and sew party of some lodge she belongs to or something? When it ought to be a home gathered together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the Bible back again. That's where we drifted to. Not criticizing, but just shaking you a little bit. But you'll understand. All the time, and all I got to close, the Philistines never noticed what was going on. There was something going on. Because something began to move in Samson's heart. There's a possibility. He felt back to see if it was still there. Some women have a hard time doing it, but they're supposed to have it. But see if his promise is still there. See if he's still made it. Just feel back and see if he ain't the same yesterday, today, and forever. He felt it. He knew there was something. He raised his head. He had no eye. They didn't notice the tears coming down on them empty sockets where the glands was letting the tears drop down. His head up, his lips moving slowly, tears falling from them blinded sockets. 
He was repenting. He knew that Jehovah still lived. Though he had wronged, he knew he was still God. The tears dropping off of his cheeks as he stood there. The Philistines was too drunk to notice that. If your church members, your colleagues in church don't notice it, you just keep on praying. Amen. He wanted to see one more time God's Word made manifest before that blinded, drunken bunch of heathens, unbelievers. That's a hungry of the church today to see once more the old-fashioned God-sent revival from the pulpit from to the janitor. An old-fashioned cleaning up. An old-fashioned revival with the power of God. A, a gospel that cleans a man thoroughly from the inside out. Gun barrel straight. Old-fashioned, backwoods, sky-blue, kiss, sin-killing religion. That takes all the Hollywood out of you. Them it's interesting. There was praying. Not a new denomination, our new creed, but a vindication of the word. Lord, you were washed up on me. You once gave me strength. If I only had that strength, I've got the muscles. But they're weak. We've got the members, but they're weak. Amen. Amen. They love things of the world better than they do the things. You say, oh, oh, look up on the churches and find out. Don't try to deny it. Your action speaks more than your words does. Yes. Well, got more members, bigger muscles, but where is the strength of the Lord? Your big muscles won't meet the challenge of this hour. Amen. The rapture and faith to take the church out of this thing before judgment strikes the earth. And judgment's fixing to strike. I say, as my friend Jack Moore said, if God lets America get by with the things it's doing now, he'll be morally obligated to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize to it for stirring up. Right? Judgment is next. God, take all the world out of me. Give me faith, O Lord, for a rapture. For there will be two in the bed and one will be taken, one left. Two will be in the... And the automobile seat and one will be taken, the other will be left. Yes. It's going to happen in a moment. You say, Brother Branham, when will it be? You might criticize this if it's all right to say. Let me drop a little something here. One day you're going to find out, you're going to say there, Oh, I've been taught that there's this, that, and the other going to happen before the Lord comes. There will be a great tribulation period and we'll go through it. Hey? Okay. Okay. You know, one time, Jesus was asked a question. He said, why does the scribe say that Elias must first come? Jesus said, I say unto you, he's already come. And you didn't know it. One of these days, you're going to say, well, I thought the church was going, had to do this, that, and the other. I thought there'd be a rapture. I thought, see, it'll be a secret catching away. If you took one here at Hot Springs and one somewhere else and one down there and one there, we'll make up literally millions of those that come up out of the ground. And there's at least 500 people every day missing the world and we don't even know where they went to. See, the rapture's going to make up of all those who sleep in the dust of the earth. That's right with God. They'll say, well, I thought a rapture's take place. It's already passed and you knew it not. You're left. Well, everything's going, yes, sir, it's a secret coming, the rapture is. Comes to steal away like that book I read that time of, what was it, Juliet and Romeo? He'd come at night time when the people were sleeping and whirling this in the church, all in whirling. And all of a sudden the cry come, and away they went. Listen, you've heard so much of the Christian businessman, the full gospel man saying, oh, you know, uh, Reverend Holy Father so-and-so, the Presbyterians are beginning to receive the Holy Ghost. The Lutherans are beginning to receive the Holy Ghost. You sleeping bunch of people. Don't you know Jesus said when that sleeping virgin come to buy oil, it was that very time that the bridegroom came. Amen. Amen. Remember, they did not get it. Is that right? right? As Booth Clifford said, huh? <laughs> they might went through some emotions, but they really didn't get it. 
When they come to buy oil, it was too late. And here they are now. The Presbyterian, the Lutheran, look at that little gospel businessman's voice. And that bunch of Pentecostal grandchildren. With these denominational brethren. Thinking that that's something great. You might ask someday, well, I thought this. It's already passed and you knew it not. Let me stop there because I, I'm not here to preach doctrine. But the possibilities. Don't you take that chance. This is the day. This is the hour. There's a possibility right now. Maybe not at five o'clock. There's a possibility. Lord, I know you're God. I know you are. I'm away from you. But I know that these fibers of mine once buzz with the power of God. I know the things that I care for today. I claim to be Pentecostal. The women I cut my hair, the man I do this, that, or the other. And you, man, that'll let your wives wear them shorts and do them things and then call yourself a son of God. Shame on you. I went to a certain great denominational church not long ago. To, they had a meeting and I went out to visit them. And the pastor took me out and he was going to introduce me to his wife. She was the pianist. And that woman had on a dress so tight that the skin was almost on the outside. She had makeup on and wore all kinds of things in her ears. And I said, brother, do you mean to say that your, your wife is a saint? He said, yes, sir. I said, she looks like a hank. I said, I've never seen such. In the name of Pentecost and holiness. Oh, brother, we need a house cleaning from the pulpit to the basement. One of these days you say, I'm Pentecostal. That don't mean no more than being a pig to God. That has nothing to do with Christ. That's just a name. You've got to be Pentecost in your heart. The fruits of the Spirit. Notice. Oh, my. He was aware what would happen if God answered his prayer. Are you aware? Are you aware that organization is going to excommunicate you? Or do you realize you're going right out of the Federation of Churches and things that you're going right into? Do you realize what it's going to cost you? You know them women you play cards with going to call you old-fashioned and all that kind of stuff? Because you won't let your children wear shorts and you're doing these things. You know what it's going to cost you? You better count it before you start. You better think about it. Yeah. You, better, you better talk it over with God first before you make the start. He knew if his prayer was answered. But he was ready. And he was sincere. If the church can only get in that condition. If you're ready right now. If you're sincere. If you really mean business. If your eyes are open to what I'm trying to tell you in a roundabout way. If you're sincere, then say, Lord, I don't care what it is. I'm ready. I see the sign. I know that it's later than we think. It's time to come. Then Samson cried out, Lord, they poked my eyes out. I know that you're a God. I know that you have power to do it. I know you can set me free from these fetters. Just once more, Lord. Just once more. Just once more, Lord. Just once more. Let there be a camp meeting on the side of a hill, like there was on the hill at the upper room. Let there come a sound from heaven like a rushing wind. Fill all the house. Visible evidence of the resurrected Christ. Just once more, Lord, just once more, he cried. As he cried out in sincerity, standing there in a blinded eye, I know the price, Lord, but just once more, uh, God answers prayer. He felt the fibers tightening. His muscles begin to take hold. His leg strength begin to come back. He said to the little boy, lead me to the post now. Lead me, Lord, lead me. Lead me to the post, to Calvary. 
lead me to the post where I can be crucified and my old worldly life dies out here and all that I am. Lead me to the post, Lord. When he began to feel them muscles tighten with the power of God, he didn't have to see what was taking place. He felt what was taking place. He began to twist his shoulders. And what he did, down with the building. That day he conquered. He killed more Philistines than he did all the days of his life. Friends, it's a possibility. Now, this church in the state, now I've got about three or four pages of notes there, and we'll let go. There's a possibility. There's a possibility right here in this camp meeting. There's a possibility right here this hour. There's a possibility if we're ready to pay the price, we can see another act take place. Once more, Lord, we've messed it up. We've organized. We broke up our brotherhood. We separate our fellowship. We tuck a little group over here. We're fighting with one another, and the devil sent back, washes, us, whip one another down. Lord, is it possible that once more that all 120 of us can be in one accord in one place? Is it possible that there come a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind? Once more, Lord, once more. Let's stand to our feet and say, Once more, Lord! Once more, Lord!